AI. In this video, we're going to look at how we can use the Python programming language to generate something like this. So this is a visual representation of a sorting algorithm. So in this case, it's the insertion sort algorithm. So it's showing an array of different values and the different values are represented by different bar heights on the chart. The index of the array is represented on the bottom. So for example, this has 30 elements in the array and the value numerically is represented on the left. The Y values, that's the height and the bar. This animation is showing what, what is happening during the sorting algorithm. So the sorting algorithm is constantly accessing the array as indicated by pink. And then if an array element needs moving, that is indicated by a red element access. For this particular sorting algorithm, the insertion sort, it's comparing whether the height of the bar that it's currently looking at is greater than or equal to the bar before it. And then if it is less than the bar that comes before it, it swaps them out. And it does this until the entire array is sorted from left to right in ascending order. So we're going to be actually creating this in Python and seeing how we can create something like this. And this also applies to any sort of phenomenon where you have something in which you're, you want to visualize each step. So what's actually happening at each step to your data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to output this plot into a sequence of images. And then we're going to create a video from that. And we're going to go ahead and create a movie in which we also overlay a sound so that whenever an element is accessed, a frequency is played. So for example, an element with a small value. So here the, where the bars are small, it will play a low frequency. And where the element is big, so where the bar is tall, it will play a high frequency. And we can actually also hear the sound of sorting. So that has allowed us to actually both visualize the sorting algorithm and also actually hear the sound of sorting. So it's a, it's a pseudo way of actually being able to understand what's going on. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to go ahead and we're going to just compare two different sorting algorithms. So on the left, we have the insertion sort and on the right, we have the quick sort. And we'll be able to see just how much more efficient the quick sort is over the insertion sort for the exact same initial input. We'll also be displaying how many times the array was accessed. So physically, the actual array itself, when it's been sorted, how many times each element was accessed and compare them between the two. Then we can see that they have similar behavior. They both end, they both have the same end point. They both end up with a sorted array with the smallest value on the left and the largest value on the right. But the way in which it sorts it and the time at which it takes is vastly different. So we can go ahead and look at one of the examples that you see online. So there's a very famous video on YouTube. Some people might have seen it. It's called 15 sorting algorithms in six minutes. I'll put a link to the description below. But basically it looks something like this. So what it does is it's sorting the heights of these bars. So these heights of the bars represent the values and it's sorting the heights of the bars in ascending order. It goes from small to large. So it starts off with a randomly distributed series of bars and then it's showcasing what the sorting algorithms do in order to sort that data. So for example, with the insertion sort, which is a very simple sorting algorithm, you can see how it takes each of the next item to be sorted pops it in the right place and it does this going over and over the array until the entire thing is sorted. Some other sort of algorithms are a bit more fancy. So you see this, this algorithm, for example, and how it builds up. And what's interesting about this is that they include sound. So let's have a look. do this is that every time the array is accessed so every time the element in the array to be sorted is accessed it plays to a particular frequency so for example if the element is small so if the height of the bar is small it will play a low frequency if the height of the bar is large it will play a high frequency and so it gives you an audible representation of how the sorting algorithm is working and we can see that even though all the algorithms are quite different the overall result at the end is that you end up with this sorted array so the small values on the left and the large value is on the right, sorted in ascending order. And each one of them has different levels of efficiency. What these videos tend to show you is how many comparisons are made. So every time an array index was accessed and then compared to another value, 
how many times that occurred, and also how many times the array was accessed. So some sorting algorithms, for example, may access an array value and then do lots of comparisons, or may access a few different array values and then do lots of comparisons with that. Whereas other sorting algorithms might be doing a lot of array accesses and minimal comparison. And so this just gives you an idea of how many of each operation is required. And in general, a sorting algorithm that uses less comparisons and less array accesses to achieve the same sorting is better. And some people have taken this even further. So for example, there's this nice one here. And what these algorithms are doing, it's the same thing. It's, it's still showing how it can sort different values. So in this case, rather than using values that are the heights of the bars, it's using the color itself. And so it's sorting the color in the spectrum. So from red to blue, and it's showing you how that's evolving and they've just decided to plot it in a circle so the correct place for red is at the top and then as you come round, the correct place for blue here at the side so that's just a different way of representing the same data but you'll hear it still has the same idea that when a that when a red color is accessed it plays a low frequency sound and a blue color is accessed it plays a high frequency sound so they all share the same basic premise is that we're actually visualizing how the how the array is sorted and it's not just visualizing, it's also doing some audio clues onto what value is currently being accessed. And so we're going to be doing something very similar to this in Python. So the first thing we're going to do in this video is actually implement the sorting algorithm and then show how it sorts a small selection of numbers. Let's go ahead and start coding. So as with most of these videos and most of these tutorials that I actually go through, you'll notice that we tend to use certain libraries or certain packages Two main ones we're going to use here are going to be NumPy and SciPy. So numerical Python, which is all our lovely number functions, and SciPy, which is all the scientific Python functions. Of course, in order for us to actually be able to plot, we're going to need matplotlib. So these are the animation functions. And you'll notice again, we are using Spider. So this is the IDE that is packaged with the Anaconda Python package. When you download Anaconda, it includes Spider. Very good IDE, has a nice variable explorer, etc. etc. And again, if you're an undergraduate physicist, engineer, or just interested in learning Python, this is probably the first IDE you'll use. Or might be one of the first that you'll actually use. And likewise, matplotlib is the sort of standard plotting library that a lot of people would use when they first start learning Python. I'm going to set the default font size of the plot. And then we're also going to set the default figure size of the plot. This is telling it that the default figure size is 12 inches by 8 inches and the default font size is 16. So the first thing we're going to want to do is create an array. So let's create an array of values. We'll call this array R. And we'll say we have 30 values and we want those values to go from 0 to 1000. And we'll also go ahead and round those values to the nearest decimal place. So in fact, these are basically integers. If we go ahead and run that code. We can use the built-in variable explorer with spider. We get a snapshot of the array and we can see there it's an ordered array, 30 values in total, going from index zero to 29. And the values have no decimal places. We can then use the function numpy.random.shuffle. And we can tell it to shuffle the array. Now this is done in place, so we don't have a return argument from this function. We just tell it to shuffle the array. Go ahead and run that using F5. Look at the array again. Now it's been randomly shuffled. The actual color in the variable explorer for, for arrays in spider go from red to blue in terms of their magnitude. So it's actually quite nice visualization in itself using spider. Next, we're going to implement a sorting algorithm. So I think the first sorting algorithm we should implement is one of the most simple ones. It's insertion sort. So we'll call this demo one insertion sort. Let's give it a variable. Let's say sorter equals insertion. So this is just a string variable that we use to be able to track the algorithm we're using. And if we go to the Wikipedia page for insertion sort, 
it gives us this expression here in pseudocode. So this is code that's generic code, so it's not specific to one programming language. It uses generic syntax. But this is the code required. And it even tells us the pseudocode for the complete algorithm follows where the arrays are zero based, which is the, indeed the case in Python. We start from index zero in our array. If we copy that in, we'll see we have loads of errors. A lot of these, a lot of the pseudocode doesn't directly translate into Python. Let's go ahead and change it. And here for this swap function, so there's no native swap function in Python, I don't think. So we're going to have to implement our own swap function. And to swap two values, you normally have to take one value, store it temporarily, change that value to the value you want to swap it to, and then change that value that you've just swapped from to the temp variable you've just stored. That can be done here. So temp, using a temporary variable, it adds one extra operation. There's no end while in Python. Python is done by tabs or spaces, by different indentations to denote code blocks. And that's it. So that it's that simple to implement a sorting algorithm. If we go ahead and run that now, go back to our array. So remember it was sorted, then we unsorted it, and now we've sorted it. So we see it's back to how it was. So we know the algorithm is working. What we can do now is go ahead and plot this. So we can see what it was like before and what it was like afterwards. So we're going to create a matplotlib plot. So fig x equals plot dot subplots. We're then going to do a bar plot. So we're going to be going from zero to the length of the array, which is 30 in steps of one. So it actually goes from zero to 29 when using this function numpy range steps of one. So on the X axis, it will be the actual index of the array. Then going to plot the actual values of the array at that index. And then we're going to align the bars to the edge so that the bar will sit at zero. So the bar corresponding to zero will sit with this edge at zero and extend to one. But then also going to implement a width not 0.8, which means there'll be a small gap between the bars. Go ahead and plot that. Have a window pop up. There we are. So that's our array before it was sorted. Then we can go ahead, copy that same code over until after the sorting algorithm. Do the same. And then we have two plots. So the first plot, that's how it was before it was sorted. And the second plot after sorting. So we can see the sorting algorithm is indeed working. Good. And in order for us to get consistent results, what we want to be able to do is take the same array every time, basically every random shuffle of the array should result in the exact same array so that when we sort them or compare sorting algorithms, we're at least comparing the same array to be sorted rather than it taking a different amount of sorts each time. So to do that, before we actually implement our shuffle, we can do numpy.random.seed and we can give it a seed, so I'll give it a seed of zero, which means all the random numbers that it generates after this is the same list of random numbers. So they're pseudo random. So the numbers themselves are random, but you can always generate the sequence if you know the seed. So it should always give this array every time we generate, which it does. One thing we can do to see how fast these algorithms are actually sorting import time so the, ta the python time library and we can go ahead and just say t naught if i variable t naught equals time dot perf counter and this will return the most precise counter available on the system which may change depending on whether you're on windows mac or linux and then after we've implemented our algorithm we can say et equals time dot perf counter minus not and the starting time for the performance counter is not defined so you can't rely on the actual value itself it could change i personally don't know where it's defined on the system with what reference it's taken whether it's when the python exe was started or the ipython console was started or when something else happened on the system that i do not know but the difference between the times should be accurate so now we have dt which represents the time taken for the entire algorithm to complete so if we go ahead and run that again, we can always access our delta t in our variable explorer, which is saying here it took approximately 304 microseconds to complete. We can go ahead and 
print that out so that every time we run this, it will be able to tell us some useful information. So we'll go ahead and do print. So we're going to print using a fast string. This is denoted by putting an F before the actual string. And this means anything put in curly brackets or curly parentheses will be evaluated as the variable. So the variable sorter, which remember we called insertion, will be placed here. And likewise for this, we're going to say array was sorted in and then in the expression, we're going to put in this expression here. So this DT, call that DT. We're going to say times that value by a thousand, give it to one decimal place and then put the word MS after it. So it'll tell us the value in milliseconds that that operation took. Go ahead and run that. We see that when we run this sort algorithm now, it tells us here, insertion sort array was sorted in 0.3 milliseconds. If we increase N and play it, we see it takes longer. So now it takes 2.8 milliseconds. So even though it's three times as much data, it took more than three times the amount of time required to sort. So the average performance of the insertion sort is O to the N squared. So it means if we increase the size of our array to sort by a factor of three, the actual time taken to sort it increases by a factor of nine typically. And that's basically what we saw here, not 0.3 times 9 is 2.7, which is very close to the 2.8. That's our first sorting algorithm. We'll do one more sorting, we'll implement one more sorting algorithm in here, but we can see here, this was our original array unsorted, and this is it's sorted. Let's implement one more algorithm. If we go to the Wikipedia page for the quick sort algorithm, we can see again, it gives us a pseudocode representation, which we can copy over. Let's copy that over. Let's make it neat. Call it demo to quick sort. Just going to copy over code that I previously written for this. So that was turning the pseudocode into actual Python code for this. Let's just go ahead and neaten up the rest of our code. And then again, we're going to include our little variable called sorter. Sorter will be called quick. We'll implement our performance counter. Again, with our DT variable. So now we've implemented our quick sort function. The last thing to do is actually to call it. So we notice we've, whereas before we did all this inline, so inline code, what we've done here is because we've copied the pseudocode over, the pseudocode was done as two functions. What we need to do now is to call the function. And we'll, we'll take our initial time as just before we call the function. Again, if we go back to the Wikipedia page, we can see it tells you here, sorting the entire array is accomplished by calling the function. That's what we do here. So we go ahead and call that with 30 elements. We see we go from the unsorted array to the sorted array, and it took 0.1 milliseconds. So the insertion sort took not 0.3 milliseconds to sort the same, the exact same array with 30 elements, whereas this one's taking not 0.1. So naively we could say this is three times faster. This might not always be the case, but in general it will be faster. If we go ahead and do the same 100 element array, so again, remember increase it by around a factor of three. Before, with the insertion sort, the actual runtime increased by a factor of nine, and that's because typically it's an O to the N squared algorithm, which means that tripling your number of elements typically increases the computation time by a factor of nine. Whereas with the quick sort, if we go to the Wikipedia page, we can see that it says that the average runtime is typically O to the N log N. So that's saying that the increase in time will be somewhere from three to nine. It'll be somewhere in between. So it's better than insertion sort. Go ahead and run that. See here, now it only took 0.4. So it only took four times longer. And actually there's some resolution as well. There's some extra resolution that we're missing off behind this 0.4. It's around four times longer. Whereas before, whereas the insertion sort took around nine times longer. 
and we can see the same array that we sorted with the insertion sort. We've now sorted with the quick sort. That's the implementation of the two algorithms. We'll go ahead and just add some nice to haves in the plot and then we'll call that video there. So if I go ahead, let's just do something like when we plot our array, we'll make sure the X limits go from zero to N. You can also add in some labels, axe.set. So we get the X label, a value of index, and a Y label, a value of value. Also set a title. Unsorted array. Go ahead and do this for our second plot. But this time we'll change the title to our sorter. And again, we'll use a fast string, which is indicated by this F. So you write F here. And then anything written inside curly parentheses is evaluated. Go ahead and run that. You see now we have the plot goes from 0 to 100. It tells us that the x-axis is the index, the y-axis is the value, and that this is the unsorted array, and this one was done using the quick sort. We can even add other things in there, so rather than just having the word sorter, so the word quick or insertion, we can get it so it actually says sort afterwards. Go ahead and run that, you see there, quick sort, value, index. So that's where I'll leave this video, it's probably gotten quite long by now. But in the next video, we'll go ahead and actually implement a method in which we can track how many times the array is accessed during the sorting algorithm. That will allow us to do other comparisons, such as say, this particular array was sorted using this many operations and see how that changes between the two different sorting algorithms. Because the amount of times it accesses the array, particularly for these two algorithms, is very indica indicative of the amount of time it takes. And also it will show you how many operations less the quick sort actually takes compared to the insertion sort. And then we'll go ahead and actually tracking these, these sorts. So which elements are actually being accessed at a time, which elements are being moved. We'll go ahead and track those and then we'll implement those in a nice animated function, which will then allow us to plot the plots that I showed you at the beginning, such as this one. So we're making that on the next video. And then if there's time in the next video, or maybe the video after, we'll go ahead and add sound. In which the frequency of the sound is indicative of the actual element being accessed. So, stay tuned.